now and for a look at believing the Chinese way in the heart of the dragon. Red is the color of the revolution and of the Communist Party in China. It also happens to be the color which traditionally stands for good fortune and prosperity. May the 4th is National Youth Day. Like most schools, number 14 middle school in Yantai marks the occasion with a ceremony and the giving out of prizes. This is the accepted picture of Chinese youth today. They are taught to believe in the Communist Party and to obey its principles. This, they are told, is the certain way to bring about good fortune and prosperity for all. But how true is this picture of unquestioning and uniform belief? China today may be changing more than it shows on the surface. Half the present population is under the age of 26. What this generation thinks and believes will create the country's future. Most of the pupils live in the Zhuji Production Brigade in Yantai, on the east coast of China in Shandong province. A self-supporting community of four and a half thousand people that grows fruit and vegetables and runs several factories. The leader of Zhuji Brigade is Mr. Zhao Kuisheng. He's not only responsible for the organization of the brigade and its economy, but also for the welfare of its members and their adherence to party policy. He's been their leader for 30 years. This brigade is much wealthier than most in China but it's an example of what can be achieved through dedicated and competent leadership. If anyone can be said to be a believer in the ideals and principles of communism, it is Mr. Zhao. At home, he is father and grandfather to a large family. Three generations of the Zhao family live together here. There's a long tradition in China of family loyalty. It has survived a turbulent history. 
But today, each generation has its own experiences. The old have known war and revolution. The younger ones have known political upheaval. The small children have grown up in relative comfort and security. They all live in a country where the state propaganda machine largely controls what they learn about the world. But what is it that molds their most strongly held beliefs? Mr. Zhao joined the communists as a very young man. The period of Chinese history that coincided with Mr. Zhao's youth was a nightmare of war, starvation and misery. As a child, his memories are of hunger and poverty. Shandong was a province where famine was endemic. Mr. Zhao and his parents had to beg for a living. He said that Zhuji village was owned by 28 wealthy landlords, and out of a thousand families, 400 were no better off than beggars. In the 30s and 40s, the country was torn by war. The Japanese occupied eastern China. Nobody knows how many millions died at the hands of the invaders, but the Chinese still consider the experience to have been as traumatic for them as the Holocaust was for the Jews. At the same time, the communists, led by the young Mao Zedong, were fighting a civil war against the ruling nationalist forces. Mao drew his support mainly from the peasants. Once the Japanese had been defeated, Mr. Zhao joined the People's Liberation Army and fought as a guerrilla. As he said, like most people, he had little idea what communism meant, but he knew who he hated. Like all civil wars, it was a war of vicious retribution. The chaos and bloodshed had never been forgotten. In 1949, the nationalists were defeated. The communists took over. It was Mao's hour of triumph. From the gate of heavenly peace in Peking, he proclaimed the foundation of the People's Republic of China. They call it liberation, or the beginning of the socialist revolution. Mr. Zhao was not yet 30. Uh, in their political classes at schools, the pupils are taught that the success of communism and the collapse of capitalism are inevitable. Belief in communism means belief in an eventually perfect human society, a heaven on earth where nobody exploits his fellow men and everybody lives in harmony and prosperity. It is an atheist philosophy and the children are not encouraged to explore other beliefs. And yet, throughout most of history, spiritual teaching occupied a vital place in Chinese life and culture. In some ways it still does. You can't go far, for instance, without coming across a Buddhist temple. Not many of them are active now, but the Fa Yuan Se in Peking still has a complement of monks. It's also one of the only places in China today that trains novices.
It is hard to imagine anything more different from Marxism than Buddhist teaching. But today these monks can hold their devotions in peace. During the 10 years of the Cultural Revolution, which only ended in 1976, all religions were outlawed and persecuted. Large numbers of monks and priests were imprisoned and tortured. Temples were destroyed. Holy books were burnt. Now the Constitution gives the right to practice religious belief within certain limits. Buddhist teaching, which came from India around the time of Christ, stresses the spiritual, not the material. They believe that what makes life so unsatisfactory for man is his futile craving for the things of this life, possessions, power, love, the gratification of the senses. They believe in reincarnation, the cycle of birth and rebirth, which will continue without end until the cravings are overcome and the spirit is freed at last. So they hold their devotions, they study their scriptures, and they spend long hours in meditation. Monks live lives of simplicity and discipline. Few people in China nowadays would claim to accept the teachings of Buddha. And yet the Chinese have always admired self-cultivation and high-minded idealism. Their favorite heroes, past and present, are men who demonstrate a nobility of spirit. And the 2,000-year-old tradition which these monks represent still has a deep influence on the Chinese attitude to life. On the southern coast of the Shandong Peninsula, there's a mountain called Lao Shan, famous throughout China for its mineral water. It is also popularly believed to be the home of many of the gods and spirits that form part of Taoist belief. There are not many pure Taoists left in China. They are less conspicuous than the Buddhists because they generally build their temples in secluded places. One of the most famous is the Tai Ching Temple, halfway up Lao Shan. It is preserved by the government as what they call a cultural relic. It still has half a dozen Taoist priests in residence. They act as caretakers and guides, and when there's time, they practice their exercises and rituals. Taoism is uniquely Chinese and originated several centuries before Christ. The word Tao simply means the way, the way of nature which lies behind the universe. The Taoists believe quite literally in immortality. Their world is inhabited by spirits and ghosts, both good and evil. And they believe that by training the mind and body, it is possible for any man to lengthen his life even eventually to become immortal.
Those who want to light the lamp of longevity, they say, must learn how to fill the lamp with oil. They start each day with breathing exercises. They believe that by controlling the breath, the body can absorb the natural energy of the universe and become physically rejuvenated by it. Master Kuang claims to know Taoists who have achieved such perfection they have lived to be over 200 years old. His own progress towards immortality, he says, has been impeded by the demands made on his time by administrative work. But he is active enough for an 86-year-old. He practices swordplay and shadow boxing, trying to let the energy of nature flow through him and fighting the evil spirits that lurk within and outside the body. The Taoist view of nature is that its energy comes from a balance of opposite forces, which they call yin and yang. Opposites like night and day, female and male, winter and summer. The harmonious balance that is life lies in the continual interaction of the two. This sense of the equilibrium of life has become fundamental to the character of the Chinese in general. They admire patience and moderation. They tend to be flexible. They aim for the balance that they see in nature. If Taoism gives a clue to the mystical side of the Chinese, there's an even more important teaching which is rooted in the everyday functioning of human society rather than in the remoteness of mountaintops. The small town of Chufu is where Confucius lived around 500 years before Christ. He's buried just outside the town. The great temple dedicated to him does not date back to his time, of course. It was built and rebuilt many times by emperors who came here to pay homage to the sage. But it still seems haunted by the ghosts of a very distant past. Much of the interior of the temple was destroyed in the Cultural Revolution, when everything to do with Confucius was under attack. But a number of musical instruments and ritual objects have survived. The bronze bells were used for centuries in the elaborate rituals that once took place in the temple. Confucius has had a greater influence on China than any other human being. But although ritual and music were important to him, he was never a religious teacher. And the whole point is that Confucianism is not a religion, but a code of behavior. He said that if you want to create order in society, you must put responsibility onto man and his actions instead of relying on the supernatural. Social and political harmony depends on the moral conduct of every member of society. Each person has his own position and his own obligations. Wife must obey husband. Son must obey father. All must obey the emperor. 
But those in the position of power must in return behave with righteousness and justice and wisdom. You must obey with respect and rule with kindness. The cardinal Confucian virtue is this sense of humanity and benevolence. It is not an egalitarian vision of society, but it is one which has always fitted naturally into the ancient Chinese pattern of close family ties and absolute rule. And this sense of hierarchy and of moral obligation towards one's family and society is still at the very heart of the Chinese way of life. But in a country where four out of five people live on the land, the intellectual teachings are only for the few. And yet there's a long tradition of popular religion. There's nowhere better to see it in action than Tai Shan, the most sacred of the five holy mountains of China. For most Chinese, their religious feelings have always been rooted in their relationship to the earth and the sky and their families. And for a thousand years, people have been climbing the granite stairway to the top of Taishan. Soon they'll be able to ride in a Japanese cable car. The porters are carrying building materials for the station on the summit. The mountain still attracts large numbers of ordinary visitors. Many have traveled long distances to climb the 6,000 steps to the peak. Taishan is the home of many important gods. At the very top, there is the temple of the Jade Emperor. It now has to share pride of place with the television transmitter. It's impossible to say whether it's religion or the view that attracts so many to the mountain now. Perhaps tourism has become a sort of religious ritual in itself. But the important thing about popular religion in China is that it avoids definitions. Ordinary people have never felt the need to make distinctions between the formal teachings. Their belief is an uncomplicated mixture of many of the influences of the past. Near the summit, there is a small shrine one of many still used by the women to make offerings for the sake of their ancestors. This is part of a tradition that is the oldest form of Chinese belief, the tradition of ancestor worship. The paper represents money to bribe the civil servants of the underworld to ensure the well-being of the ancestors. It's a custom that is still quite widespread in the countryside and it recalls some of the most fundamental beliefs in China, the feeling for hierarchy, the idea that the right rituals bring about prosperity, and that if the supernatural powers are kept happy, all will be well in the world of men. Mountain tops have been considered holy since the earliest recorded times because they're close to heaven. The Chinese have never thought in terms of one almighty God who created the universe. The cosmos and heaven are what influence the affairs of man. And if you want health, prosperity and happiness, there are innumerable gods and spirits who might be persuaded to pull a few strings on your behalf. On Taishan, the place that attracts the most visitors is the temple of the Princess of the Colored Clouds. She's the goddess of fertility.
They make offerings to the princess of money and food, even cigarettes and sweets. They believe that it's in her power to meet the most central need of every Chinese family, a child, above all a male child. And now that the state has introduced a policy of one child per family, the favors of the princess are more than ever in demand. It's a very down-to-earth approach to religion. It's not only the old who come to pay their respects. The young visitors react with a mixture of reverence and embarrassment, but many still ask for favors. They've all been taught at school to take what they call a scientific view of life. Those like Mr. Zhao, who believe in communism, feel that the party can offer more tangible rewards than religion. The Chinese are a very practical people. What matters most is family, the home, security. For over 30 years, the country has been run by the Communist Party, and most people now look to the party to provide for their needs. For many, like Mrs. He, who grew up in great poverty, the change has been dramatic. The revolution has, in this respect, replaced religion for many. It has given more people security and prosperity than the old gods could ever deliver. And yet even those for whom life has so greatly improved have little cause to think of the party as infallible. The last 30 years have not been so simple. At the end of the 50s, there was the disaster of Mao's forced collectivization program, the great leap forward. Then there was the Cultural Revolution. No one who lived through it will ever forget what happened when belief became fanatical. In 1966, Mao Zedong proclaimed the great proletarian cultural revolution. He was desperately anxious not to lose control over the party after the failure of the Great Leap Forward. Mao denounced his rivals for advocating a heretical capitalist policy, that of offering people material incentives to make them work hard. With the cultural revolution, all the old ways of thinking were to be swept away. And his messianic leadership the nation would achieve a revolutionary purity with all minds thinking as one. His followers raised Mao to the status of a god. His sayings were published in a little red book which became holy writ to be studied, memorized, and chanted, even used to cure sickness. mass rallies surpassed anything the world has ever known. And the emotion was as though Hitler, the Pope, and the Beatles had all been rolled into one. But the hysteria and idealistic fervor soon turned into anarchy. Groups of young people known as Red Guards roamed the country, attacking anything that represented authority, culture, religion, or old traditions. Books were burnt. Works of art were destroyed or defaced. 
teachers, doctors, party officials, lawyers, intellectuals of all kinds were publicly humiliated or tortured, driven to suicide or murdered. Children denounced parents, neighbor denounced neighbor, and many old scores were settled. It was a time of terror. It's officially said that a hundred million people suffered in those 10 years. Almost the entire managerial class of China was forced out of office and sent to work on the land. Administration, education, and the entire economy came close to total breakdown. And by the time Mao finally died in 1976 and the Cultural Revolution came to an end, it was not easy for anyone to believe in anything. But 4,000 years of history have shown the Chinese to be a remarkably resilient people. The emphasis in the last few years has been less on political purity. The present policy is the four modernizations, the all-out effort to achieve modernization of industry, agriculture, science and technology, and defense. In practice, that means that at last, it's respectable to make money. Government policy now encourages individual brigades to diversify, to build their own factories, and up to a point to negotiate their own deals and contracts. In the Cultural Revolution, Mr. Zhao, like many other leaders, was humiliated and paraded through the streets for following the capitalist road. Now, he's as much a managing director as a political leader. And for the members of his brigade, there's now a direct incentive to put their backs into the four modernizations. The harder you work, the richer you'll be. Brigade is now building a textile factory on land that used to grow vegetables. It'll be much more profitable. For the workers, the years since 1979 have seen enormous change. The average income of the brigade has almost quadrupled. In this area, one in three households now has a television set. Most families have a year or two's income tucked away in the bank. Mr. Gao is a tractor driver. He's in his 30s and a typical member of Zhuji Brigade. He's recently bought a television and a wristwatch. Now he's saving for a washing machine. He is still astonished by the luxury of it all. <laughs> Mr. Gao and his wife live with his mother-in-law, old Mrs. Her. She has six children, all married, and more grandchildren than she can remember. It's only on very special occasions that they'd eat a meal like this. And yet, compared with the average in China, Mrs. Her and her family live very well. <laughs> and the children of this brigade represent a new generation that has never had to worry about where the next meal is coming from. Their parents have money left over to spend on other things. <laughs> for the party, this new appetite for prosperity creates new problems. Ostentatious wealth has always been frowned on in China, and it's hard for the old generation to come to terms with a new acquisitiveness. <laughs> Uh 
，路方去了，啊，他就上路方去，家里面摆的更阔气。Faced with this new consumer mentality, the authorities see it as an urgent task to preserve the old, selfless, revolutionary values. And it's through the party-controlled school system that they try to pass them on to the next generation. Of course, the children are taught the principles of party doctrine. But today, there's a greater emphasis on teaching them values which are just as much Confucian as socialist. Respect for authority, self-denial, consideration for others. Values which are felt to have been undermined by the Cultural Revolution. The headmaster of the brigade's primary school. This 也爱党，也爱写个主义，也爱集体，也爱劳动，重情劳戏。The song says, we are little sunflowers, and we grow up in the warm sunshine of the party. These are the modern nursery rhymes of China. And from the earliest age, they are taught to follow the example of Lei Feng, a soldier who died young in the 1960s. He said that his aim was to become a perfect little cog in the revolutionary machine. He did nothing particularly heroic, but he was kind to old people, he did good deeds, and he was devoted to his country. Every child is urged to become another Lei Feng. Just通过向雷峰叔叔学习啊，去下了很多的好人好事，在学校里啊，有个小姐姐叫什么名字？叫小红，她有一天呢，背着书包去上学，走在马路上，忽然看见了一只钢笔，小红姐姐呀，赶
On Tuesdays and Thursdays after class, children from the primary school divide into groups of six or eight, calling themselves Learn from Leifang Teams. They visit the old and needy and do good deeds. This group has adopted an 80-year-old widow. Almost every child in China between the ages of 7 and 15 becomes a young pioneer. They're like political boy scouts. The object of this Saturday morning outing is to visit the local Revolutionary Martyrs Memorial. The party considers it of the greatest importance to keep reminding the young generation of the hardships and sacrifices of those who fought for the revolution. They parade in ranks by age. A representative of each group reports to the team leader. The salute with the hand held higher than the head symbolizes putting the party and the country and the people before yourself. the inheritors of communism, they sing. We learn hard and we struggle continuously and march bravely towards victory. Their scarves are red like the blood of the revolutionary martyrs, they are told, and shaped like a corner of the red flag. With a hundred million members, the young pioneers must be the biggest little army in the world. There's not much to do in the evening at Zhuji Brigade. Some of the teenagers gather in the brigade headquarters to play cards and Chinese chess. Many of the young are idealistic. But in general, it's this age group that appears to worry the authorities most. In the cities, there's unemployment among the young and a significant increase in crime. They're attracted to Western clothes and pop music. Some are even reported as suggesting that the fifth modernization should be democracy. The authorities say these are only the views of an unrepresentative minority. But the newspapers and party leaders sometimes use the expression, a crisis of faith, while denying that there is one. They warn of the dangers of bourgeois decadence and of a loss of confidence in socialism. Jiangqi 
，有些根本讲理论讲不下来，走过到那马列区，有些西门理论呢，讲不下来。我大家没什么问题啊。Out of a population of four and a half thousand in the brigade, there are 104 party members. That's only about one in 25 of the adult population. It's their task to carry the torch of idealism and to urge the masses onwards towards communism. Once a week, the party branch meets in the brigade headquarters. The lecturer is a former Red Guard, now the deputy leader of the brigade. 以根本观点或精确关系。The Cultural Revolution has not improved the image of the party, but throughout history, the ordinary Chinese has had little to do with politics anyway. As a famous old ballad says, "I work with the sunrise, rest with the sunset. What do I care for the power above?" 这个世界上的世界是一个新的世界，这个世界上的世界是一个新的世界，这个世界上的世界是一个新的世界，这个世界上的世界是一个新的世界，这个世界上的世界是一个新的世界，这个世界上的世界是一个新的世界，这个世界